1945 saw the lights go on again. Once more, the nation's capital was blazing in all its glory. And in cities throughout the nation, the blackout was ended. Germany had surrendered. The war in Europe was over. There was still a war to be fought to a finish in the Pacific. But that couldn't dim the celebration that marked the fall of Hitler and the end of his dreams of world conquest. After the war was over, we came back uh, to California, from California, came back to Arkansas, came back to cross it. There's every, all the influx of people uh, coming out of the war, the soldiers and people out of the aircraft and shipyards and all uh, from uh, the war days is uh, there were no jobs. And dad was trying to get a job, paper mill, sawmill. And um, so we were in the dry county, so daddy just started bootlegging whiskey and <clears throat> make a living. And uh, he did pretty well at it, so he stayed with it the rest of his life. Uh, he, he, there were some consequences with it. He was arrested several times and he went to prison, but that didn't deter him from his occupation. <laughs> he continued it. Dad and mother were very intelligent. Uh, mother uh, lived in a world of fiction, and uh, uh, we lived in the country. She was isolated way out in the country. Daddy wanted that way in that old shotgun house that helped him do his business from there. Daddy was a different type of cat because he was a, you know, back, that was an era when you did, we didn't have television. Everything was coal, lamp, battery, radio, privy. Uh, water in a staple bucket on the back porch. You broke with a gourd and put it out, put it on the heat, heated on the uh, wood stove, and the, and the kitchen's only room was heated with a wood stove. My dad was a man's man. He was a rogue. He was Rhett Butler and Gone with the Wind. He was a good looking, handsome guy, and uh, he. Uh, the ladies' man uh, gambled, carried a gun on him all the time. Never went anywhere without a pistol stuck down his waistband. But that's what it was like in those days. My mother was uh, because of the, being isolated and uh, didn't have a way to get around. Daddy didn't take her any, many places or anywhere. She was uh, lived in a world of fiction. She read a lot of great novels. She had me read. Gone with the Wind and Faulkner and all those guys, William Faulkner back when, uh, back when I was in junior high school. She said, here, read this. So I started reading Leon Uris, guys like that. Uh, mother was in a world of, uh, came worse as I, we got older, alcohol and barbiturates and, and all. And uh, it was, I can understand why I didn't understand then, but I don't understand more and have more empathy and sympathy for it at that time. Well, it was at night and we were there together. I was, uh, uh, I'd been to college. I was off of college. I'd come home from college and uh, on the weekend and uh, Hitchhike. It took about 10 hours to hitchhike from across it, from Fayetteville to cross it. But I was home. She was, uh, uh, been drinking, been on barbiturates and glassy eyes and all. And, and it, it repulsed me. And she came into my room and sat on the edge of the bed and talked to me and didn't say anything wrong. She just wanted me to kiss her. And, and, uh, and I turned my head. I wouldn't. I said, I told her that night that, uh, that uh, I wished that she would, would be safe and, and could be taken care of, and I'd rather never see her again and know she was not ever in this condition ever again and, and to see this. And uh, she got up and walked outside, and uh, 30 seconds later, I heard a shot, and she took her life. So for about 30 years, I always thought that I was the reason but I found out later my brother had found a, a letter, a suicide note letter, had been written long earlier than this that explained everything. And uh, Donnie had read it, and all he was trying to remember is a 14-year-old mind having read it and showed it to Daddy. My daddy destroyed the letter and told, told Donnie and never to tell me. And, uh, but Daddy never knew what the last final minutes were with Mother. And... Uh, it might have made a difference to him to let me know that uh, that it wasn't uh, just me. I knew later on it wasn't, you know, but that night I 
felt like I was the guy that made her pull the trigger. I think it exists in every family. I don't think anybody's immune to this. I mean, uh, my story is probably similar to a lot of people's stories. I've had people walk up to me after I wrote Bootleggers. Boy, I've had people say, you know what, Coach, I read your book, and you know what? There are a lot of parallels in your life and mine. And I said, and I found that out to be true. I mean, mine's not unique in the fact that, uh, and I'm not saying every Everybody got dad was murdered or mother committed suicide, but there are a lot of people who've had a lot of tragedy in their families in uh, in different ways that uh, it can really harm harm the harm you for life. And all here again, I think is this because I was wired a little bit differently and just a little tougher coming along about uh, being mentally tougher. I'm not talking about physical toughness. I'm talking about mental toughness. You know, hey. Play out your hand, get a smile on your face, look people in the eye and say, hey, people don't judge you for what uh, happened in your family in your life, I found. like I always thought when I went off to college, I said everyone knew about my background and everyone knew that uh, my dad was in state penitentiary when I was a senior in college, I mean senior in high school and didn't get to see me play football. And I went to college and my dad was just getting out of prison. and. I, it's in the papers and all. I thought, hell, everybody knew about it. Hell, nobody knew about it. Hell, people didn't read the newspapers. College kids didn't. They were too damn busy thinking about themselves to think about me. I found that out, learned that later on. But I, but I thought that when I was 18 years old, 17, 18 years old, when I had the inferiority complex and the insecurity that I possessed when I went to college. But I finally got over all that and realized that that's, that's incidental. People don't give a damn about it what happened to me or my family. It's how I conduct myself, how I treat people. It's what I am, what I am going to be that determines uh, how people are going to accept me and treat me. And so it's all about not letting your past be an anchor and drag your ass down. It's about, about you doing something about you. And uh, now if, if you got yourself into addiction along the way, then it's a tougher, I don't know what, you need help, you need counseling. and. Uh, that's never happened to me. I've never had to fight out of something like that. I hope the hell, I don't think, I think it's too damn late. I think I've missed all that. <laughs>